Thank you for being willing to listen to me in English. I'm going to talk about karma and chaos with a particular focus about how they apply to the life of someone who meditates regularly. So we're not just going to discuss karma and chaos as ideas, but we're going to discuss them as tools for a practical application. And the application is to live a life of meditation. Karma is a very helpful way of understanding reality, particularly if you are a meditator. And chaos theory is a useful introduction to a way in which a Western educated person can more clearly understand karma. So there's a, a linkage between all these topics. My very practical focus, only talking about these ideas as they apply specifically to Vipassana meditation, reminds me of a story about two dogs. One dog was a street dog from Paris. He was very rebellious, very individualistic, didn't believe he should follow anybody else. And he said to the other dog, I've been studying human beings and I think they're terrible. <laughs> they cause wars, they're uh, warming up the entire planet, they're leading to an extinction of all our fellow mammals. I think we should stop wagging our tails at them and we should stop obeying them. And the second dog was a, a dog from Chicago. So he was also rebellious, but he had the American pragmatic attitude. And he said, I agree with everything you've said. I can't disprove any of it. However, you should remember that human beings are those who know how to open the door of a refrigerator. <laughs> <clears throat> the Buddha greatly emphasized the idea of karma. He used the word kama, which is a, a Pali word, but I'm using the word karma, which is the word that has become part of English vocabulary. So the Buddha greatly emphasized karma as intrinsic to his teaching. Today there's a lot of meditation that is based upon an experience of immediacy, being aware of things in the moment, which is an excellent and important feature of meditation, but it's not the whole story. And there are also meditations in which people come to believe certain ideas that are called Buddhism. Buddhism means ism in English, means a systematic form of thought. So Buddhism is a systematic form of thought based upon the teaching of the Buddha and one can believe this. But what I'm going to steer you towards is the teaching of the Buddha, which happened before Buddhism was invented. Buddhism was invented hundreds of years after the Buddha died. And the Buddha's teaching was based upon direct experience of the reality of life through Vipassana meditation. He wanted people not to have an idea or a philosophy, but to meditate, gain an experience, and from their experience, live a good life. And so when I say he emphasized karma, that means he emphasized karma as part of the experience that one gains through the actual practice of Vipassana meditation. The Buddha's chief disciple, a man named Sariputra, came to the Buddha's teaching in the following way. He was walking down the street and he saw one of the Buddha's first five disciples, a man named Bhante Aswajit. And Sariputra, who was very cautious and skeptical intellectual, said to Aswajit, I hear you're following a great teacher. What does he teach? And Aswajit said, he only teaches one thing. If there is some effect in this world, there must have been a cause. If you don't like the effect, 
take away the cause. That's the entire teaching of my teacher. Of course, if a person is looking to reduce or eliminate their suffering, then Aswajit's words are very powerful and very important. If there is an effect called suffering, then there is a cause for suffering. If you don't like the effect, get rid of the cause. So Sariputra immediately began to follow the Buddha's teaching, practice Vipassana meditation, and became a leading historical disciple of the Buddha. The word Buddha was used in the time of the Buddha, and the Buddha was referred to as the historical Buddha. But actually, the Buddha usually referred to himself by a different term called the Tathagata. It's a term that's uh, variously interpreted. The literal word means thus come and thus gone, somewhat ambiguous. In its more poetic form, we say that it means the Buddha was a, a, a emergence and manifestation of universal truth. He spoke that universal truth, and then he merged back into the universal truth. So he came thus out of the universe, and he went thus back into the universe. But the Buddha gave a very uh, practical and less poetic definition of what it means to be the Tathagata, which is his name for himself most often. And he said, a Tathagata is someone who sees cause and effect everywhere. So you can see the absolute critical importance of causal thinking in the teaching of the Buddha. And to me, this was also very comforting and important because as in the days when I was seeking a proper kind of meditation for myself and as someone immersed in the scientific tradition, I couldn't imagine following something that didn't have logical, rational, causal explanation for how meditation worked. So in the old days and in the modern days, this emphasis on the causal sequence, on the universe as being logical and causally understandable, has been uh, helpful, it's been inviting, and it remains important. Therefore, karma is a way of looking at things that's part of both right understanding and right action, because it's our actions and our understandings that all become part of our karma. But there is a difficulty with karma, and that's one of the reasons why it was intriguing to me to look at chaos theory and see whether it could help me in my understanding. And the difficulty with karma that many people experience, that I experienced, is that it's not always obvious where our karma is coming from or what karma really means. Now, one other feature of karma is that it can, it's a concept or a perception that can only be applied to oneself. The Buddha said, we cannot use this word or this idea, karma, when we look at other people. So if you hear it colloquially in common speech, we say, well, that guy had a heart attack and he was a smoker. That's his karma. And the Buddha would say, no, you're not using that word correctly because you're applying it to someone else. Or we can say, that guy worked very hard. He trained and trained. That's why he won the Olympic marathon. What great karma. And the Buddha would say, no, that's incorrect. Only a tathagata, only someone who sees cause and effect everywhere and understands it perfectly can apply it to someone else. So when we're talking about karma, we're always exclusively talking about a tool to help us understand ourselves. Each tool has its proper realm. There's a story about a person who heard that laptop computers make an excellent tool. And so he borrowed his friend's laptop computer to uh, hammer in new shingles on his roof. Each tool can only be well applied in its proper sphere. 
So karma is something we apply to us. And when we look at ourselves, the Buddha said we should be understanding ourselves as part of a causal, sequential, logical, lawful universe. But it's not always intuitively obvious that this is true. People will say, how did I get this disease? I never did anything to create this disease. Why can't I get rid of it? Or people will say, I've been meditating quite seriously. I've taken many 10-day Vipassana courses. I practice meditation twice a day, every day. And I still have a, this certain problem that I came with. I'm working hard to get rid of this problem. And after five years, I still have the problem. If karma worked, I'd be rid of this. I don't think karma works. So we see things that we don't like about ourselves in our life, or we see things that we'd like to get rid of in ourselves that we don't like, or we see things that we don't understand in our life situation for which we feel only a victim. We, didn't, we don't feel we caused it at all. So how can the Buddha's statements that as you get wiser, you see cause and effect everywhere, that understanding cause and effect is the key feature of the teaching of the Buddha. How can we integrate this with our personal experience, which often doesn't clearly show where the causality in our circumstances lies? If you're going to meditate to some degree you relinquish some control over your life, apparently. For example, if you're a student and you meditate while well, you're not studying. If you're a parent and you meditate while well, you're not taking care of your child. If you're a worker and you meditate, you're not earning your keep for that hour. So meditation requires some confidence that what you're doing is valuable, that what you're doing will contribute directly to your life. And that understanding of meditation with the idea of karma and with the need to explain the apparently inexplicable, that use of karma is best applied after a person meditates to the extent that they understand and realize the heart of Vipassana meditation. So we need to take a moment to understand what Vipassana is and how it gains its definition. It's not all meditation. It's not any meditation. It's a specific kind. What is the specific feature of Vipassana? There are several specific features. Of course, Vipassana can be scribed for hours at a time, so we'll give a, a focal, brief definition. One thing is, Vipassana is always taught for free. It was taught by the Buddha. The Buddha gave it away for free. If we think of the Buddha, a Tathagata, as something that the universe manifests, the universe has a voice and speaks and explains what the universe is about, well, that's not going to be taught for a fee. So Vipassana is always taught for free. Second feature of Vipassana, it's logical, it's rational, it's based upon causality and karma. Third feature of Vipassana, it's always taught as part of a moral or ethical worldview. To learn Vipassana, it's necessary to adopt an ethical attitude. That's different than the many meditations which start out as just observation. Vipassana always starts out with taking vows of a moral lifestyle, not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, etc. And finally, Vipassana meditation focuses on the sensations of the body. And more specifically, Vipassana meditation focuses attention continuously, as continuously as possible, on the sensations of the body so that one can observe 
the change, the constant change, the, the incessant change that goes on in the body. Each one of us is born, lives a certain period of time, and dies. That transition from birth to death is accompanied by constant change. And that constant change is perceivable by each individual as he or she examines themselves during meditation. That change is happening all the time, every second, every millisecond, in every part of the body continuously. So Vipassana, properly practiced as taught by the Buddha, is part of an ethical way of life in which you observe your sensations, your bodily life, constantly changing, 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 changing. Every second that you're meditating is different than the previous second. There is not a fixed or artificial focus outside yourself. Instead, the focus is to look inside yourself and to see reality. And reality means the change that's going on incessantly as you move from birth to death. Understanding this change is understanding the causal sequence as things rise up and pass away, rise up and pass away. And as things rise up in every moment, sensations are rising, sensations are disappearing. Each sensation is caused by the previous moment. So a human being is a sequential caused phenomena. Each moment caused by the previous moment, and each moment causing the subsequent moment. So when you meditate on sensations of your body, you immediately perceive two laws of the universe. One law is everything's changing. All material aggregations, the human body, the entire planet is an incessant change. And the second is the change follows lawful sequence. One event causes the next event. But as we discussed, in the moment as you're meditating, and if you learn Vipassana, you learn to meditate over a period of time, you see how one thing moves into another thing. One thing flows into another thing, the way a river flows. But when we look at our life as a whole, sometimes it's difficult to see the causality. We don't see what caused our good fortune, and we don't see what caused our problems. Sometimes it's easy to see, sometimes it's hard to see. So let's look as modern scientists and see whether we can give a meaning to karma that is consistent with our modern scientific thinking. We don't want to fall prey to blind belief where we say everything that happens to me is karma, but I have no idea why. I don't know why I got this disease. I don't know why I have a good education or a bad education. I don't know why I was born in the United States or Europe. And just to say it's karma, well, that's just belief. So let's look at uh, modern scientific causal thinking. Early scientific thinking was based upon linear cause and effect. The classic description of linear cause and effect is if you play what we call pool in the United States, I think called billiards. You take a cue, you hit one ball, and that ball hits another ball. It's possible to predict exactly what the second ball will do. If you took physics in high school or college, you learned that the momentum of the first ball and the angle at which it strikes the second ball gives you an exact and perfect prediction of what the second ball will do. That's Newtonian physics. We all studied that, or I don't know. I had to study that in high school and college. And that's the model of causality that doesn't seem to apply at all. If I got a disease, where did it come from? Who struck 
a ball that gave me this disease or what did I do to get this disease? If I was born in the United States, how did that happen? Who caused that? Did I cause that? How could I have caused that? So the simple science by which post-Renaissance Europe built the modern world, the science that led to machinery, the science that led to the first stages of medical treatments that were non-superstitious, that science is a wonderful gift to all of us, but it doesn't help us understand karma. If we look at the sciences that try to understand more complex phenomena, I think we'll understand karma better. More complex phenomena is, I don't know if any of you are good at playing pool, but if you're terrible at it, I remember times when I take the cue, strike the ball, and it would just bounce off the table. And when it bounces off the table, it just bounces around like crazy. And there's no physics teacher in the world who can explain why it's going to bounce the way it bounces. That's what we need to understand, is that crazy bouncing ball. There's a form of equations that describe the universe in the mechanical linear way. Those are the equations we generally study in mathematics. An equation is a law or a statement and the statement creates a line, a picture, a graph, and that line gives you the ability to predict into the future based upon the original statement. But there are some equations that create very irregular shapes, nonlinear equations, and they were difficult to study before computers because the calculations become very wild. You can take the same equations and out of their predictive pattern will come very variable patterns. So to study so much variation, you need a computer that can run the equation out many, many iterations, many repetitions, faster than a human being can do it. The first field of science in which this was applied was weather. It's very important to us to predict weather. It determines our commerce and our health and yet weather is quite chaotic. It does not follow a fixed pattern, particularly here and also where I live in the northeastern United States. Weather is extremely variable. It can be um, 20 degrees one day in winter and minus 20 two days later. It can snow, rain, and be sunny in the same day. And as scientists began to study weather, they realized predicting it through linear Mathematics is totally useless. It's like karma. But predicting it through mathematical nonlinear equations graphed by computers gives us some ability to predict the weather. And that's why typically today when we listen to a weather report, it's somewhat accurate for one or two or three days ahead and gets decreasingly accurate in the future. But we have some ability to predict the weather. So one of the key figures who helped us learn how to predict the weather was a meteorologist named Lorenz who studied nonlinear differential equations for prediction <coughs> of weather graphed in uh, graphing computers. This goes back about 50 years ago. And he uh, greatly advanced our ability to predict weather. One of the first things that was discovered was that Although weather varies greatly, it does not vary totally. There is variation, but there is order within a particular zone. For example, the sun is millions of degrees of heat. Many of the planets are absolutely cold, but Earth varies only about 100 degrees, an incredible phenomena. Our weather very rarely gets above 40 or 45 degrees anywhere, ever. And it very rarely gets below minus 40 anywhere, ever. Why? 
Why doesn't it occasionally go up to 50 or 60 or 80, which of course would end all of our lives, but how does the planet manage to stay within a zone of 100 degrees? One of the great mysteries. I hope it's not going to change. It looks like it might. So Lorenz discovered vast variation in weather is not that variant. All weather has a certain zone of constancy. There's a beautiful poet in the United States named Robert Frost. He's a poet who lived in the area of the Northeast United States, which we call New England, and he's our great poet of New England. He lived mostly in northern New England, that is Vermont and New Hampshire, where the weather is very cold. I would say it's uh, sub, it's just below subalpine, so it's the kind of weather you might have on a Austrian mountain, not at the top where you have alpine zone, but just lower down. And he farmed in this very cold area. And he gave a beautiful poem. It's too long to recite the whole poem. But in the poem, he says, one of the features of our moral, psychological life, and one of the features of biological life on the planet, is that there's no fixed lines between wrong and right. But there are roughly zones whose laws must be obeyed. And he gives an example. He took a peach tree. Peaches typically grow around Virginia, which would be, say, 800 miles south of his farm. And he transplanted this peach tree to the colder zone. And as he's writing this poem, what we call in New England a nor'easter, which is a, a corrupt English pronunciation for northeaster, a northeastern storm called a nor'easter sweeps into New England. And the nor'easters blow in from the northeast, that means from the northern Atlantic Ocean, one of the most violent storm-ridden parts of the world during the winter. The storm brings wind and snow and very low temperatures. And Robert Frost, the poet, is sitting in his house looking at his peach tree, thinking it's going to be frosted, the buds will be frozen solid, and it will die. And then he says, why are human beings always trying to do something new, create something new? If I'd left this peach tree in Virginia, it would be a healthy tree. Of course, I wouldn't get any peaches out of it. But I transplanted it to this cold zone. Why? Because there's a chance it might live. If we didn't have such a cold storm, maybe it would have lived. So there's no clear line where peach trees can survive. But there are roughly zones whose laws must be obeyed. You can't plant a peach tree in Greenland, but you can give it a try in New England. This is true of our psychological and moral life also. So when we look at the concept of karma, what did I cause? What is happening to me in my life? I'm not aware of having caused this or that. I don't know what I can or can't do that is correct or proper. There is no clear line between right and wrong, but there's roughly zones whose laws must be obeyed. I had an example of this just the other day. Someone came up to me after a, a talk and they said, I've just taken a 10-day Vipassana course. It was absolutely excellent. I would like to continue this meditation the rest of my life. But I've come upon a moral problem. I'm a relatively poor person. I can't afford to buy organic food, which is more expensive than regular food. But I feel if I buy regular vegetables, they've been sprayed. The spray has killed insects. And I've taken a vow not to kill as part of my life as a meditator. And so I'm breaking my vow. What should I do? 
and I told this young woman a story from the teaching of the Buddha where he teaches Vipassana to a young meditator. In those days, there were no meditation centers, so people would just go off and sit at the root of a tree where it would be shaded. India is very hot, so in ancient India, when the Buddha was teaching, you'd sit in the shade under a tree and practice the meditation you just learned. And this young meditator was very enthusiastic. He went off to meditate. He went to the root of a tree and looked down. He saw a lot of insects and ants. He said, well, I better go to a different tree. I don't want to kill any. He went to a different tree. There were some worms or caterpillars. I said, I better try a different tree. And if, if you've been to India, you know it's a tropical country teeming with life. Everywhere he went all day, he couldn't sit down for fear he would break his vow and kill something. At the end of the day, he returned, and the Buddha said, how was your meditation today? And he said, I couldn't meditate because I couldn't find a place that was free of insects where I could sit. And the Buddha said, there's no clear line between right and wrong. You can't be so rigid in your morality. Do your best. Try not to kill anything. Try to keep the vow. But to turn it into a fetish that cripples you and prevents you from even being able to meditate is making a clear line in the world of moral and ethical ambiguity. A second feature, and this one you could say is the first feature of chaos theory, the first feature of complexity is that even when things seem to vary all over, or weather varies all over the place, but it doesn't. It varies within a range. A second feature is there are phenomena in nature called attractors. And the common example is used is a magnet. But there are attractors, for example, to the climate. The climate is attracted to the zone of plus 45, minus 45, or you could even say plus 40, minus 40. Something is keeping the planet in that zone. And there's a theory that the ice ages or the ages of great heat when there were giant ferns in the middle of the United States and Europe, these zones happened when the attractor changed. We may be in a change of attractors right now. Personally, I hope not. This is very important to a meditator because if we're trying to live a life of awareness of what we're causing. Buddha says, being aware of what we cause and what causes us is the heart of the teaching. If we're trying to do this, we want to be aware of what we're causing and we want to cause a good life for ourselves. But sometimes it seems overwhelming. There are so many problems on each of our minds. Every person is dealing with economic problems, health problems, political problems, social problems. Even if you have pleasant friendships, pleasant family, you still have some problems in your friendship, problem in your family. And when you close your eyes and start to meditate, many, many problems come up on the surface of your mind. You're supposed to be observing your sensations and being aware of eternal change and instead you're thinking why did he say that to me he's such a jerk i'm always nice to him and he says nasty things to me that's not my karma i didn't cause it he's the one who said it and so this struggle goes on to understand how can we create a good life for ourselves there was a buddhist monk about uh, 15 years ago who criticized the Vipassana meditation and said, well, it can't be the teaching of the Buddha because we each have so many problems, you can't get through to the end of it. How could the Buddha ever have gotten through all his problems? All humans have problems, even the Buddha had problems. How could he have gotten through all of them, one by one by one? The Buddha says we live millions or billions of lifetimes. Think of all the problems he had. How could he get rid of all of them? sitting there meditating, you'd have to meditate for billions of years to get rid of all your problems. And the answer is, there are strong attractors. 
That means that when you meditate, sometimes you're attracted to a problem and it seems like that problem is taking up your whole life. Classic example, a young adult is trying to figure out what should I do with my career? How should I earn my living? Do I want to go to this kind of school or that kind of school? And that becomes a strong attractor. It occupies your mind. Now imagine if meditation and the meditative way of life and the Buddha's way of life becomes a strong attractor to you. Just as the weather is held within a band of temperatures, once you become organized around a strong attractor of the teaching of the Buddha, your whole life is held within the confines or the bounds as described by the Buddha as the right way to live. In that moment, hundreds of problems may disappear within a second. Many moral dilemmas may disappear once you have guidance. Many questions about how you should live, what way you would like to live, will disappear in one second. So meditation resembles weather, first in that it, it gives life an organizing principle within certain bounds, without rigid rules. Second, it can help you reorganize your life around a strong attractor that holds you steady, even though there's no fixed or rigid point, there's no other person holding you steady. It isn't even a matter of being rule-bound or obedient. It's a matter of meditating in such a way that your life becomes organized in a swirl of activity that stays within fixed realms. A good example of how something can be organized yet fluid. The first principle of meditation is everything's changing. How can that be organized? A good example are the rules of sports. If you're watching a football game, there are certain fixed rules. They've got lines. If the ball goes out of those lines, it's out of play. They play by certain fixed rules. Every day there must be a million football games going on on this planet. Latin America alone, there's probably 900,000 every day. Every little kid, every little kid in India, every little kid in all of Europe is playing football. They're all playing by the same rules. And every single game is different. There's no two games that have ever been the same. You have constant change, constant variation within fixed limits and fixed rules. Another principle of chaos theory is the importance of very small effects and how they can be magnified into very large effects. This became popular. Many people have heard of the so-called butterfly effect, which is not an actual real event. It's a metaphor. The metaphor is that a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere over the Indian Ocean creates a little bit of turbulence. And the turbulence creates a change in temperature the change in temperature creates some convection currents, and the convection currents create some winds, and the winds travel across the ocean and get stronger. And as the winds travel further, they get increasingly strong over the vast expanse of the ocean. And so once these winds get to South America, they form a storm. So allegedly, there's a connection between this butterfly's flapping of its wings and a storm. That's not to be taken literally true, but it's a metaphor of how small effects can cause larger effects. Now, this is very important in the life of a meditator because although there's no clear lines between right and wrong, Vipassana meditation, the teaching of the Buddha, is actually based upon a strong commitment to live a moral lifestyle. And the Buddha emphasizes being very careful about your personal morality. Why? Some little tiny deviation. How much will that hurt? If I shoplift a small little thing, how much will that hurt? You know, in the United States, we have these mega stores, these giant chains like Walmart, 
And I've heard sometimes young people rationalize, well, if you shoplift from Walmart, I mean, Walmart's gross annual income is probably worth more than most nations. So how, they won't miss it if I take something. How wrong is that? But the answer is, well, there's a butterfly effect. It may not appear in Walmart's balance sheet, but what about in your own mind? Who can say that these little variations and permissions that we give ourselves to deviate from the ideals we wish were true on this planet, how will they affect our own cynicism, our own idealism, our own treatment of other people? So the butterfly effect has an important psychological ramification. There was a good story about two convicts who were in prison. The first convict says, I was put in prison because I broke some moral rules of society. I have been punished for that. I recognize that I made a very big mistake. And when I leave prison, I won't do this again. It was a butterfly effect. I made a small mistake, and I ended up with a 10-year prison sentence. The second prisoner said, when I get out of here, I'm going to do the exact same things. I didn't make any mistake at all. The problem was those other people set their ethical standards artificially high. Another feature of complex causal thinking, where we're not looking for an immediate effect from an immediate cause, but we're looking at variation within limits. We're looking at the strength of certain attractive variables. We're looking at the long-term ramifications of minor deviations. Another one is multiple effects from the same action. I saw this very frequently in my life as a psychiatrist. It's one of the complexities of human life, a complex phenomena, an apparently chaotic phenomena, that one trait can produce both pleasant and unpleasant effects in the same life. I had many examples where someone, for example, would have a very forceful and charismatic personality which is often a very good thing in the world of business or in professional life, a person who's got a lot of uh, energy, a lot of um, drive behind their personality is likely to be successful. That same person, however, may have impaired interpersonal relationships. No one likes to be pushed around by a bully. No one wants to be a friend of someone who's always dominating and controlling. So a trait that works well in business is not necessarily a trait that works well in marriage. Ironically, we often get rewarded for traits in one sphere, which we get punished for in another sphere. So one form of action can have different impact in different spheres of life. And one form of action may not show its effect for a period of time. Lots of times I meet relatively young, relatively new meditators, very enthusiastic people who are meditating on a daily schedule, taking 10-day Vipassana courses once a year, and making very good progress, very pleased with it. But they'll say, well, I have this problem. I came to Vipassana with a certain problem, let's say, I'm addicted to cigarettes or I uh, drink alcohol in a sometimes self-destructive way. And I've made great progress, but this one trait hasn't gone away yet. And there may be a feeling in that person of some frustration or some defeat. And the answer is it may take more time for an effect to be manifested. This is life, human life is not the same as taking a billiards cue and striking a billiards ball. Sometimes persistence is the secret of making an effect manifest. So we can see linear thinking. I, I did something and now I want to see the effect. We can see linear thinking can be highly inhibiting. 
whereas complex causal thinking can be very productive. And the attitude there is, I'm putting out into my life this effect. Every day, I'm making the effort to be aware, conscious of my sensations, aware of change, accepting change, observing change neutrally, and living an ethical, moral life in which I'm aware of the ramifications of everything I do. That may not produce every single effect that I want every single time, but why should I give up? Isn't it reasonable to assume that if I keep expressing one causal variable over time, if I keep emitting this signal, that in the long term, it will have a causal effect. So that's confidence that even though there can be varying effects from one cause, over time, that cause will manifest itself around a strong attractor in an effective zone. Another part of complex causal thinking that helps us understand the idea of karma is a concept called the edge of chaos. In old scientific thinking, the world was seen as ordered. Maybe some people thought, well, God orders the world. Every sparrow that falls, God makes that sparrow fall. That's not a very satisfying theory because then God is making all kinds of mass murders, all kinds of extinctions of animal and human life. But some people thought that and found some satisfaction. Other people, more scientific and religious, felt the world is causal up to a certain point. But there's also chaos, no order, caprice. Things are not clearly causal, or they're clearly causal. Both of those exist in this world. Chaos exists and order exists. But in the chaos theory or complex scientific thinking, there is not a dichotomy between order and disorder. They're on a continuum. Things are very ordered, partly ordered, or less ordered. Nothing is totally disordered, however, according to scientific thinking. There is some degree of order everywhere. The degree of order is more or less. For example, a river that's flowing takes many different shapes. The shapes are somewhat chaotic. When you think of looking at a river flowing past you, you see whirls and swirls and many shapes. But it's not totally chaotic. You don't see any squares, for example. You don't see any oblongs. So a river is relatively less ordered than, for example, a human body, which is much more ordered. Today I look like myself, tomorrow I look like myself. There's a tremendous order within the change. I don't look like I looked 20 years ago, so there's constant change. But the change follows a very ordered path. A river is much less ordered, but it is not totally chaotic. There's no squares floating down the river. So order and disorder are degrees of each other. And when we look at things that appear to us to be random or capricious, the question is, is there some degree of order, less degree of order than we would like, than we wish, but some degree of order in this apparent disorder? A very important example is the Buddha's idea of anatta, no, there's no self. Generally, we grow up feeling, well, here I am. I'm myself. The Buddha never said that we don't have a subjective sense of self. He said, of course you have a subjective sense of self. But it's not an eternal, enduring thing. It's not an entity. It's not an essence. It's a self-perception by a highly organized phenomena 
that's caused by many, many, many causes. The Buddha didn't speak in terms of chemistry, physics, biology, but as modern scientists, we think the body is a product of atoms organized into molecules, organized into cells, organized into tissues, organized into organs, and the organs are organized into something we call an organism, that is to say, us. The level of complexity within each human being still greatly exceeds the possibility of science to understand. It's very organized, but there's nothing within it that is separable from the organization of the things. There is no essence, there is no element. The joke in medical school was always that in the old days, uh, some scientists, early scientists, thought that the soul was located in the pineal gland. The pineal gland is what puts out melatonin. So all of you who had a nice rest last night, it was based upon your melatonin from your pineal gland, but there's no soul there. So there's a vast degree of organization, but there is no thing, no essence that endures. So when we look at the world through the eyes of the Buddha's teaching, we see change in everything, we see order in everything, <coughs> we see lawfulness in everything, but we do not see any enduring thing. Now this concept of the edge of chaos helps us understand that. The edge of chaos means that the most enduring forms of phenomena combine order and some disorder. First, a simple example. If you have a society that's heavily ordered, a dictator comes in and says, okay, everybody's gonna do this, everybody behaves like this, if you don't do this, we shoot you, that becomes very ordered. Usually does not last a very long time. As soon as the dictator dies, everybody rebels and chaos follows. If you take a chaotic society, you find a great degree of disorder, a revolution, usually it does not last a very long time. There's a limit to how long people can tolerate the disorder. But if you take a democratic society, you find the most long enduring societies. And the reason is there is order, there's lawfulness, there's rules, but there's also a chance for change. People can argue, people can disagree, people can vote governments in and out, and you have a mixture of rigidity, that's lawfulness, with fluidity, that's change. Now, the human being is actually a system. Our bodies and minds are systems at the edge of chaos. We're heavily ordered, as I discussed, where atoms, molecules, cells, tissues, organs, the total organism, vast amount of order, order, and yet we're capable of remarkable change among the entire biosphere. Human beings are most remarkable for the amount of change and transformation we can tolerate. We can live at the poles, we can live in deserts, we can live with heavy clothes, we can live with light clothes, we can build houses, we can live in a vast array of changing circumstances. So the, the combination of complex control and the ability to face newness and go with the flow, follow change, is one of the features that has made human beings the dominant life form on the earth. Who knows, maybe that first dog was correct and it's not necessarily a good thing, but nevertheless, we manifest that, that feature that at the edge of chaos, where a system is both ordered and chaotic, that is to say both capable of stability and capable of change, you get the most enduring system. Now, in the mind of a meditator, this also becomes a very striking phenomenon. Meditation on the surface is an attempt to control your mind. When you begin the Vipassana meditation, 
you begin by practicing anapana, which is a form of mastery of the mind. You try to control your mind, relative control of your mind, by giving it a focus on the breath. So it would appear superficially that meditation is a form of mind control. You say to your mind, do this, uh, meditate on your breath, and then later on, meditate on your sensations. Try to focus your mind on one thing and not let your mind focus on other things. So the simple understanding is, well, it's an attempt to impose order or control on your mind. But anybody who actually experiences meditation over, for example, 10 days, as when you take a 10-day Vipassana course, you find a mix of two things. You get very ordered, focused, clear mind called samadhi. And after you get that, you get very wild, stirred up, crazy, daydreaming, visioning, thinking mind. In fact, one of the benefits of meditation is that it, is permit, it permits the unconscious mind to come up on the surface. And one of the reasons it permits that is it would be wild if the unconscious only came up on the mind. But if the unconscious comes up on a very controlled and ordered mind, the control and order helps buffer the creative, changing, varying potential of the uncontrolled. So as a person meditates, their mind reveals and shows in nature this truism, which is that the greatest wealth of life forms, the most adaptable and adjustable life form, occurs on the edge of chaos where you have both order and variability. And one of the benefits people feel when they meditate, they go, oh, I got such a great insight during my last course, or I realized something about the way I should live. I've never understood that before, and when I took this 10-day course, I got clarity finally. And that comes from not merely imposing order, but imposing order and allowing your mind to run up to the surface in all its complexity, in all its chaos, in all its creativity. The last feature I want to discuss of a complex attitude towards order. To me, this is the most important, and it was the one I found most satisfying when I began to enter into the world of meditation. And that is an unbounded sense of time and space. All of Western thought is based upon a bounded sense of time and space. In the beginning was the word, or on the first day of creation. Well, what about before the first day? And then Western time is also based upon a last day, a final day. If it's religious, it's a day of judgment. Well, what about after the last day? There's nothing. Well, where does everything go? The sense of time and space in the Buddha's teaching is without any horizon, there's no limit. The Buddha says, either there was no beginning, or if there was a beginning, there's no point in you thinking about it. <laughs> and there's not going to be any end, or if there is going to be an end, there's no point in you thinking about it. It's going to be a long time from now. As far as any human can see, there was never a beginning, and there's never an end. Nor is there something where if you go far enough to the left, it stops. Or you go far enough to the right, that's the end. There's a big wall. There's no beginning. There's no end. There's no horizon. There's no limit. One of the most important features of causality in the teaching of the Buddha is that causality continues. And we don't know how long it will continue. And we don't know how long the causality within us came from. In Western science, we say, well, we're a product of genetics and environment and genetics came from our parents. But actually, the genome is fairly constant, even back into bacteria. 
at the very least, it, with the most rigid Western scientific thinking, we'd have to say all of us are carrying genes that are about at least a billion years old if they're carried forward from bacteria. Of course, there's a great debate where our genes come from, and there's genetic material outside of the genome, so that's too complicated for us to get into, but we can just say each person in a scientific sense, each person is a product of billions of years of serial cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. So we are preparing a world that will go on for billions of years. We are preparing it. The world is being bent through us. We are shaping it. Naturally, each one of us has a very small impact. The bacteria who were creating the genome didn't know how important they would be. So lots of our agonized questions about ourself. Why is this happening to me? The answer is, well, you have to, if you really want to account for it, you've got about a billion years of history you have to figure out. A billion is a metaphor, of course. And if somebody says, what does it matter if I make a little error here or there? All of us make mistakes, of course. Well, the world is now being passed through us. We are the lens through which living forms are passing. We are temporary. There is no enduring self in us, but there is an enduring impact. And we have no idea how long that impact will go. And we have not absolute control, but there are zones whose laws must be obeyed. There's a beautiful a number of poems by Robert Frost. Robert Frost <coughs> was uh, also very funny. And whenever he said something, he usually said the opposite in the same poem. So he's called an ironic poet. Uh, there's a, a moment where he was looking over a spider web, and in the spider web was a spider, and in the, the spider had captured an ant, and the ant was holding onto a moth that it had captured. And all these little lives were all tied up together. And he looked at it, and he found it very beautiful. And he's, he, um, he used a couple of words that uh, maybe I should define. Uh, there's a word, um, appall, A-P-P-A-L-L. -L. Appall means to be very shocked. Like when I was a kid, if I did something bad, my mother might say that was bad. But if I did something really bad, my mother would say, I'm appalled. So Robert Frost created a phrase, he said, the order, the design of the universe is for darkness to appall. It's almost a religious idea, although it's put in a metaphor. And he's looking at these little insects, and he says, it could not have come down to us through the long bead chain of life and death, but for design of darkness to a ball. Every event that's happening to each of those little insects was caused by a previous event, which was caused by a previous event, which was caused by a previous event. There is some design, and it dispels darkness. There's a beautiful statement by Albert Einstein who said, most people think that studying science makes you cynical, it makes the universe seem cold and dead. It's just a chain of cause and effect without any creator. But Einstein said, most people look at the universe really through a very personal and narrow frame of reference. What's going to happen to me? What's my life about? Will I get the job? Will I lose some income this year? 
And he said, we're living as if we're living in an optical delusion of consciousness. Our consciousness is like a, an optical piece, like glasses or binoculars, and they're creating a false reality. An optical delusion of consciousness keeps us blinded. But when we throw off the shackles, when we are emancipated from the narrow personal self and study science, we are humbled by the vision we get of the grandeur of reason that is incarnate in existence. Einstein did not feel that human beings impose laws upon nature to give order, but we are discovering the intrinsic order that is incarnate. Incarnate is stronger than present. There is some reason that is manifesting or incarnating. And that was Einstein's view of the universe. The Buddha said, a Tathagata, a fully enlightened Buddha, is someone who sees cause and effect everywhere. Einstein said, reason is incarnate in existence. The Buddha said, supposing a person were lost in woods that had no order, no meaning, no purpose, completely lost, a dark woodland. He thrashed around for days, trying to find some way out, couldn't find any direction. But suddenly one day he stumbled upon a path, a good path, a wide path, well trod by wise men and women of old. And he followed this path and it led him out of the trackless wilderness. And he came to a palace and a city where there was a wealth of grass and water and beautiful buildings and adequate food. The Buddha said, I have been, like everybody else, a person lost in a meaningless, disordered wilderness. But I have stumbled upon this ancient path that has been walked upon by the wise men and women of old. And now I can point it out to you. I think we'll stop there and little time for questions. <laughs>